find you, they'll get to you sooner or later. And uh, today I'm going to begin a brand new sermon series on fortifying your family with the whole armor of God, fortifying your home, your family. And uh, I'm going to begin in a very light introduction. There are eight sermons. We, we have some down here that need them all the way in the front, Brother Neil. And we, we, I want you to understand this, that there are eight sermons in this particular series. And uh, the first sermon is going to be a very light cornerstone that we lay for the seven remaining that is coming behind it. And uh, we'll be ta- we'll, we will eventually be talking about some of the things that you have on your stock card this morning. But I want to ask you a couple of questions, and I want you to listen very carefully. I wonder how many people who are watching by internet, and let me say this, if you are watching by internet today, it's a joy to have you here at Buford Road. We're glad that you've tuned in and you've taken the time to uh, sit down with your Bible and pen and uh, participate in the singing and uh, the participation and uh, the joy that we feel here at Buford Road. And we thank you for that. We want to know that you're watching. So please take time to tune in and comment and let us know that you're there. We, we're blessed by that. And uh, I want to ask a question today that's applicable to everybody that's here this morning and even those that's watching by internet. And I want you to think about that. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand. But let me ask you this. I want you to think with me as we begin this new series today. I wonder how many people in here this morning or that's watching by internet honestly feel that your family is so full of God right now that there is no need or reason to improve it. I mean, you're just so full of God. You've got it all going together. You, you think that uh, the, this situation that you're in right now, it's, it's the perfect home. It's the perfect family. It's the perfect husband. It's the perfect wife. It's the perfect children. That there is absolutely nothing that would necessitate some improvement in your home or your family. Now, if that's the case, then let me say this. You're doing a whole lot better than the very first family way back in the Garden of Eden. And I want you to think about that because if you honestly think that there is no room whatsoever for your relationship, your home, your family to improve, I want to remind you of something that Adam and Eve were living in a perfect environment. And while they were living in a perfect environment, they doubted and disobeyed God. And in that disobedience to God, Eve was blaming the serpent for her trouble. Adam was blaming Eve and he blamed God. Remember, he said, the woman thou hast given me. And so this this family, the first family in a perfect environment who doubted and disobeyed God, who started to turn on each other. The serpent made me do it. The devil made me do it. She made me do it. You made me do it. And eventually had a child that killed his brother. And so I ask the question today, is there anyone in here, and you don't have to raise your hand, those of you that are listening, if you feel that your situation right now is so full of God and so perfect that there is absolutely nothing that needs to be done to change it, 
then unfortunately we'll be wasting some of your time today. But if you feel that there's something, there's, regardless of how minute, how large, something, there's something missing. There's something I could be doing better. There's something that I could be doing more of. Then please pay attention and please don't tune this out. My second question is this. Have you ever found your Self, as you were raising children, or in some cases you still are, have you ever had someone say to you while you were raising, for example, your son, and someone along the line, because of the way they looked, the way they talked, or the way they walked, said to you, He reminds me of his father. Maybe you're raising a daughter, and my question would be, have you ever had someone to say to you, she reminds me so much of her mother? But the real question would be, have you, and here today, you watching by internet, has anyone ever had anybody to say to you, while raising your son or daughter, he or she reminds me so much of Jesus. I want us to think about this today because we're going to begin this series, eight sermons beginning today on fortifying your family with the whole armor of God. Because here's the truth of the matter. None of us live in a bubble. And everything that was put forth to the first family by the way of a satanic attack, believe you me, we still do business with that same old devil. And while the environment may be changed, we may not be living in a perfect garden. But I will tell you what, we still do business with the same old devil. And so I want us to see some important truths this morning from the Word of God, and we're going to be looking at the book of Ephesians for a lot of what we're going to be talking about and fortifying your family with the whole armor of God. First, let me have a word of prayer with you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for the opportunity Lord, the health, the strength that I have today to stand here in this pulpit and to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And I recognize today, Lord, that my privilege, my ability to be here this morning has come through the avenue of multitudes of people praying for me and my position and my my problems that I had, the surgery that is behind me and the healing that's before me. Lord, all of this, all of this, Lord, we give you the praise and we thank the sainted thousands upon hundreds of thousands, maybe all around the world that have uh, prayed for me that I don't even know about right now. And I ask you, Lord, to bless this church, everyone that's watching today, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you a little background just for a moment. Uh, You know, sometimes when I preach Uh, I I believe that it's important to lay a good foundation on some of the background of what we're talking about. The book of Ephesians is an incredible book. And if you're looking at your stock card this morning, I want you to see this. Because in this brief background, Ephesians was written somewhere between A.D. 60 and A.D. 61. At the end of Paul's second missionary journey, and you know that he took three, at the end of his second missionary journey and more than two years on into his third, he ministered to the church at Ephesus. Now, there were a lot of things notable in the church of Ephesus. And when I say notable, I don't mean by uh, very good standards, 
by any means. There was a lot going on that Paul had to go in there and deal with. A lot of new converts and a lot of idolatry. In fact, in Ephesus, there was the Greek goddess Artemis, And many people worshipped that god. Ephesus was full of idolatry. When Paul went into Ephesus and he found this circumstance, he found this situation going on, I want you to understand that many people did respond to the gospel. Many people were saved. But many people opposed his preaching as well. In fact, there was a prominent silversmith there. You have heard of him in the scriptures, uh, Demetrius. And uh, as Paul was preaching and people were getting converted and saved, uh, they were giving up their idols and people who were making idols for the people started to lose business. Their livelihood started to suffer because now instead of serving or worshiping idols, they were now serving and worshiping Jehovah God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, the business of these silversmiths making these idols was hurting significantly because of the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Now, Ephesians deals with topics at the center of what it means to be a Christian, both in faith and in practice. And if you're reading with me today, Ephesians deals with critical issues to help fortify your family and living out your faith. I want you to see this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse number 10 and 11, And I'm going to make mention of several things today that I believe will help you in this very first message on fortifying your family with the whole armor of God. I just showed you a picture just a moment ago of my grandson receiving an award for walking into a bathroom and finding a young man trying to hang himself trying to commit suicide. And by the way, let me say this, and I want to be very clear with it. A lot of depression and a lot of things like this has taken place since COVID hit back last february is really. But I want you to understand something, that COVID is not the cause of it. We have been affected by it, but let me tell you this. Things that come against the family, things that come against our mind, things that come against our body, things that come against our family, we cannot blame it all on COVID. The Word of God teaches us that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and I assure you, friend, he is roaming. He's looking for every nook and cranny he can possibly come into your life with. And I have chosen this particular series because we live in a very difficult time. And when I showed you that picture of that young man, my grandson, receiving that award from his superiors, I wrote him a letter, and this is what I said. I said, Josh, I want you to think about the parents on the other end. You walked into a restroom, you found a young man trying to Hang yourself. Had you not been there at that right point, that right time, think about what would have been and think about the heartache on the other end. And I wonder through all of that, did he know the Lord? Did that young man's family ever take him to Sunday school? Were they ever in church? What type of spiritual background did they have? Because we are living in perilous times. And we need the Lord more than we have ever needed him in our life. The Apostle Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, finally, my brethren. And by the way, he has just gone through some very vital issues concerning the family. 
In chapter 5, he talked about wives submitting themselves to their husbands. And let me say this, a wife cannot do that if their husband does not respect them. He just finished talking about wives submitting themselves to their husbands and husbands loving their wives. He had just finished talking about children obeying their parents and the Lord. And he had just finished talking about fathers provoke not your children to wrath. He had just set some great monumental things before us that revolve around the home and the family. And then he comes down to this part. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, he said, Now finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And in verse number 11, he said, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I want you to think about that with me today because I believe with all of my heart that many Christians truly do not understand or fully understand why there seems to be so much adversity in their life, so much adversity in their home and in their family. My goodness, if we were to take time today to open the auditorium up for testimony, I really believe that you could stand here today and say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me and my family because we're going through this, we're going through that. Pray for my son, pray for my grandson, pray for my daughter, pray for my granddaughter, pray for a niece, pray for a cousin, pray for my mother, pray for my father. We could all stand here today and talk about something that is heavy on our heart that's affecting us as a family. Every single one of us, and I think that sometimes... Even as Christian people, we fully do not understand why there seems to be so much adversity in our life, why there seems to be so much of an attack on the family. I believe it's the great battle that each one of us face on a daily basis to do what Jesus really instructed us to do, and that it was to take up the cross and to follow him. That's a struggle. That's a battle that we go through on a daily basis. I think the battle, the spiritual warfare that we get involved in, it takes a tremendous toll upon our faith. It takes toll upon our hope, our peace, our relationships, our compassion. But let me assure you that the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in, it takes a huge toll on the family. Spiritual warfare will leave us drained sometimes physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But let me assure you of something today that the devil has in his evil army. He has forces, I believe, that are arranged by ranks in different categories because the word clearly teaches us that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but the word says, but with principalities. And that's written in the plural sense. We wrestle with principalities and different powers and the different rulers of darkness. So understand something, that the devil is not out here by himself trying to do all this stuff, even though he does a pretty good job with it. I want you to understand that he has many forces behind him. We call them a demons and demonic forces and fallen angels. Many wicked spirits have authority. And what the simply means is this, that there is a highly fortified demonic hierarchy that's been set up, listen carefully, not only to come against the church of the living God, not only to disrupt and rob our joy, not only to poison the world and to discredit God and to create all the havoc in the world today, not only forces trying to remove the Bible off of every public square and every public building and every place possible, not only trying to replace evil with good, but let me assure you of something, the devil and his comrades today are doing everything they possibly can to create chaos and division and confusion and and disruption in every household. He's got us on his hit list. So keep in mind that the demon spirits that work hand in hand with the devil, they are not disgruntled human beings that are mad at God and who are mad at certain people. And listen, we can't, we can't omit that kind of thing because the devil does use cold and indifferent people every day. 
But right now I'm talking about the principalities that come against us. They are fallen spiritual angels, creatures that seek to hurt us in every imaginable way. And just because you can't see them, that doesn't mean that they're not there. Never underestimate them. Demon spirits could be living in your living room. They could be riding in your car. They could be in places that you frequent. They could be occupying places of work. They could be possessing somebody. They could be oppressing somebody. They're everywhere. And people are being ensnared. They are being destroyed and ruined every single day. And let me assure you of something. There is absolutely no reservation that the devil has when it comes to you and your family. There's nothing that he would not do. The devil is always looking for opportunities to seize the appointed day. Whether it be large entrances into your life or small ones, he's looking for. If you remember in the book of Job, and I did not put this on the uh, card this morning, and I don't even believe I gave it to Brother Justin, but if you remember back in the book of Job, God asked the devil something in Job chapter 2 and verse number 2. He asked Satan this question. He said, from whence comest thou? Where have you been? What have you been doing? And the devil answered God. He said, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And so understand this. He is always on the prowl. He is always looking for the disadvantages in our life. And I want you to notice something. And this struck me. This put almost like a neon light on the scripture today. I want you to see this. And it's in verse number 11 and verse number 12 of Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and I want you to see this. The word against, this word against is used one time in verse number 11 and it's used five times in verse number 12. And so I want you to see this in verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand, number one, against Underline that in your Bible against the wiles of the devil. And then in verse 12, for we wrestle not against, that's the second time it's mentioned, flesh and blood, but against, number three, personalities, against powers. Look at this, against the rulers of darkness of this world. And then against spiritual wickedness and high places. So a total of six times in two verses, you find this word against. And that means this, listen carefully, the Holy Spirit is making it very clear that the devil is against us. The devil has never been, nor will he ever be for us. He, and let me say this. Speaking about his fiery darts, he's not a bad shot. He knows how to hit the bullseye. He knows how to afflict us. He knows when to afflict us. He never sleeps. He never takes a holiday. He never quits. He never disappears. He never wants to leave us alone. And listen carefully. Most people are led to believe that in this modern age, this modern society of Christianity, that we should only be talking about love, joy, and peace. And that would be wonderful if that was truly what it was all about. Everybody just get along and everybody just be politically correct. And listen, there are some people who believe that preachers ought not to be in the pulpit just uh, preaching on these kind of things, but they should just be tickling ears, talking about warm and fuzzy stories. And I've started a uh, something on Wednesday night when I got back this past Wednesday. Let me say this. Everything that comes out of this pulpit, you need to check out and find out if it's true or not. You ought not to just accept it because I said it. Let me tell you to put the word of God to it. Put the compass of the word of God to it. Check it out. Make sure it's true. Make sure it's right. Make sure it's accurate. Because Modern pulpits today are being swamped and filled with all kinds of preachers just telling warm, fuzzy stories. I really believe that the reason why that there are so many icicles in today's pew is because there are too many polar bears in God's pulpit. Can I have a witness? 
And we need to get back to the place where we believe in preaching the whole word of God and not just making people feel comfortable. I, you didn't come in here to, if you came in here today to be entertained, you came for the wrong purpose. I hope and pray that you came in here today to hear from heaven, to hear from God, to hear God's holy word preached. Listen, the devil has preachers and pulpits all over this world. I want you to think about it today. This is serious business. He has an army. He has an agenda. And it works the same way, basically. Let me say this. We've got to, we've got to know everything we can about the enemy. If we're going to do battle with him, then we've got to know everything that we possibly can know about him in order to win. Let me say this. It's go, it goes the same way even in a physical, a visible army. I mean, the United States typically does not go to war until we know a little bit about the enemy, until we know who the enemy is, where the enemy is, what is he doing, how big is his army, does he have allies, what kind of weapons does he have, what are their agendas. We, we learn all that we can possibly know. And let me say this, that when it comes down to spiritual warfare, because we're all engaged in this thing when it comes to the home and the family, we need to know as much as we possibly can. Now, I want to share with you some things today that's on this card that goes hand in hand with a very light approach to the cornerstone of this series. I believe these principles will help you when it's time to do battle with Satan, when it's time to come against his forces and against his wiles and his trickeries, I want you to know that these things will help you prepare for those spiritual encounters. Number one, and this is something that every home and every family, I, I really believe that if you're not having personal devotions in your home with one another or with your family, you're missing a lot. I really think that the home it will only be as strong as the people who lead it. And you have got to take a sincere, real approach to the spiritual well-being of your home and your family. And if there's not a time in your day where you don't take the Word of God and open it up with your family and read a passage of Scripture and pray, take prayer requests. By the way, you'd be surprised at some of the prayer requests you'd hear from others in your family. But I want to encourage you to do that. You need to fortify your home. You need to fortify your life, your family with every possible resource. And if I were still raising children today, what I'm going to share with you right now would be something that I would emphatically teach every child in my family. Because I know how real the devil is. And let me say this. Just because I'm a preacher, that doesn't mean that my kids are going to turn out right. And just because you come to church, that doesn't mean that your kids are going to turn out right. Oh, we want them to turn out right. We pray they'll turn out right. Maybe we even pray for them in our private prayers. But I'm going to tell you something. Having your children to turn out right is much more greater than a wish list. You've got to actively get involved in this. And if I were raising, and I, I, I have grandchildren in my home all the time. If I were raising my children all over again, let me tell you this. These things right here, I would make sure without question they understood and understood it in its fullest. And that's number one. Satan was defeated on the cross. You see, God's people do not have to walk around in defeat. Satan wants to defeat us, and he wants to make us think that we have to live defeated lives. And many Christians are living defeated lives because they do not understand the power of the cross. They don't understand the power of the blood. I want you to look at this. Here are a few things that every Christian should know about spiritual warfare and everybody in your household ought to have a firm grip on this. And number one, Satan was defeated on the cross. He might think, you might think, 
People of the world may think today that he's having a heyday and he really is to some degree. But the bottom line and the truth of the matter is he was defeated on the cross. And I want you to look at this passage of scripture in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Paul said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Look at that very carefully. Here's the thing that we need to understand and our children need to understand, that the cross of Christ is the only thing that can bring us to God. The cross of Christ is the only thing that can bring us to Jesus. Without the cross, there would have not been any blood. And if there was no blood, there would have not been any redemption or forgiveness. There would not have been the passageway for the Holy Spirit to come into our life. There would not have been any blood, any mercy. Without the blood, there would not have been any pardon, any peace, no everlasting life and there would not have been any fortification for our family. You see, it all goes back to the cross. And we have to understand that Satan was indeed defeated on the cross. I want you to listen carefully. The symbol of the Christian church today is not a burning bush. It is not a table of stone. It is not a seven branch lampstand. It is not the star of David. It is not an angel with halos. It's not the Ark of the Covenant. The symbol of the Christian church today is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It all goes back to the cross. And number one, I would make sure that every person in my household understood that in spite of everything that's going haywire in the world today and in our own personal lives, we don't have to live defeat in defeat because Satan was defeated on the cross. Number two, I want you to look at this. As the devil brought sin into this world, sin's penalty was paid for all people for all time. There are two scriptures that I would like for you to see about this. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18, Peter said, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 3, Paul said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We can never get to the place where we forget that Christ took our place. He became our vicarious substitute on the cross. He paid our debt. And listen carefully, he signed my pardon. He signed your pardon with every single drop of blood that he shed. The payment is just as good for sin today as it was the day that he was nailed to the cross. Sin's penalty was paid for all people. Now, if your household doesn't know that, you need to teach it to them. Number three, real quickly, not only did Christ pay the penalty for sin, but look at this, sin's power was broken. The devil desired to eternally torment our lives, not only on this earth, but for eternity. But when Jesus died and he rose again, the devil lost his monopoly on sin, death, and the grave. Paul said this in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then look at number 4. Satan and his army is truly out to destroy us, not only as individuals, but also as a family. He's not out just simply to slow us down and to put a hobble in our step or simply to make us miserable. The devil is out to completely annihilate us. In Luke chapter 22, verse number 31, 
The Lord said this to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Don't ever think for one minute that because you're in a church house today or because you've got some believers in your family that your family is untouchable. I assure you of this, that if the devil was able to get to the first family in the garden, he is certainly able to get to your family and my family today. The word sift here in that scripture is compared to the word thresh. Jesus told Peter, he said that the devil wanted to thresh you around. He wants to work you over. He wants to beat you up. He wants to make you feel useless. He wants to dismantle you altogether. Number five, look at this. The next thing we need to remember is that no matter what storm, no matter what obstacle, no matter what spiritual encounter that we're going through as families, and by the way, I will tell you that in many, many recent months, I have been helping families go through some of the most unbelievable spiritual battles that you can imagine. We need to learn how to turn our battles over to the Lord. When David was a little shepherd boy facing the Philistine Goliath, this is what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, when thou hast whom thou hast defied. And so listen carefully. If you have never never dedicated your life, if you have never dedicated your home, if you have never dedicated your family to the Lord, that I would encourage you to do it. And if you say, yes, preacher, I remember the day I dedicated myself to the Lord. I remember the day I dedicated my home, my family to the Lord, but somehow or another, we've been moving backwards. Somehow or another, we have lost our vision. Somehow or another, the devil has moved in. Then I would encourage you all to take time, take a breather, take some time out and rededicate your life, rededicate your family, rededicate your home to the Lord. Don't take one day for granted. We've got to remember that we're no match for him. There's a few things that I want you to think about that you can do. If you turn that card over just for a minute today and fortifying your family, you're going to need every piece of armor of God And we're going to begin mentioning them next Sunday and talk about them in an individual way. But God has made every piece of armor available to you, accessible to you. Here's what I want you to think about. And the satanic battles that come against you, when you feel that your home is losing its grip and its firm foundation, You're going to have to learn how to resist the devil in every possible way. James 4 teaches us that. He says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So how do you resist him? How do you resist such a horrible, a horrible foe? How can you do that? Look at Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to give you three quick ways this morning that you can do it. And, and I assure you of this, that the more scripture you know, and the more often you quote scripture, you're going to find yourself in a much easier place to do battle with the devil. Far too long, the devil has Christians, has believers on the run. And we get scared. We don't know how to deal with him. And we find ourselves running from him. We find ourselves being trodden down with him. We find ourselves losing sleep over him, losing peace over him. We find our families in shackles and in shambles. And there's so much confusion and strife. There's so much hostility. There's so many words, hostile words going back and forth. And you wouldn't be able to tell that your family was a believer if you, if you didn't make that declaration yourself. It just seems to be that there's just so much chaos in your home. Listen, I'm going to tell you how to deal with that. Far too long the devil's had us on the run. I think it's time as believers because we recognize that he was defeated on the cross and all of these other things that I've shared with you. Wouldn't it be much better for us to put the devil on the run rather than him putting us on the run, chasing us everywhere? Let's just get to the place where we say, devil, I'm sick of you coming against my home, my family, my friends. I'm just sick of this. In the name of Jesus, you were defeated on the cross. Now listen to this, when the devil comes against you 
I'm about to pop a stitch here. When the devil comes against you, listen, look at Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Now I want you to look at this. You've got to learn how to plead the blood of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood, he defeated the devil. He defeated hell, death, and the grave. You see, the blood of Jesus is a, is a place, is something that the devil cannot penetrate. And so here's the thing. Whenever you feel that your life is being consumed in such a hostile way, and that you're being overtaken, you, you just know that God's not pulling you down. God's not destroying your family. God's not uh, sending the Holy Spirit into your family's life, creating a bunch of confusion and commotion and chaos. And you recognize this cannot be of God. It only has one source, and I know that it's the devil that's coming against me. Here's what you do. Number one, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So this is what you do. You get to the place where you say, oh God in heaven, listen, I need you, I need your touch, you turn to Satan and say, listen, I'm not running from you anymore. You're not going to destroy my mind, my peace, my love, my compassion. I want you to know that when Jesus shed his blood on the cross and I invited the Son of God into my heart, into my life, I asked the Lord Jesus to cover me with his precious blood. And just as he defeated you with his blood on the cross, I'm going to defeat you today in the name of Jesus by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what you do. You just plead the blood. You plead the blood. When you feel that things are coming out of hell against you, here's what you do. You, start, you say, well, preacher, I, I can't pray on my job. I'm at work. Listen, and you respect your employers. You do everything that you know to be right. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, the word says. But this is what you do whenever you feel so overwhelmed. Maybe you're driving down the road in your automobile. and Maybe you're walking in the front door of your home. And you felt good all day, but you felt like you walked into hell when you got into the house. Maybe you feel like you're turned upside down going to bed. Maybe when you put your feet on the floor in the morning, you feel, oh my goodness, the devil is in this place. The devil's coming against me. He's putting thoughts in my mind. He's making me think things that I know I should not be thinking. God help me because I feel like saying something that I know I should not say. I'm getting ready to do something that I know that I should not do. Here's what you need to do. You need to stop right then and there and say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. Have you ever heard the old saying, if you can't sleep at night, count sheep. You ever heard that? Well, listen, if you ever get to the place at night where you can't sleep and you feel like your life is just on a storm-tossed sea, don't count sheep, plead the blood. And you plead the blood until you fall asleep. And then when you fall asleep, I promise you, you will sleep the rest of the night like a baby. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And then notice the next part of that verse. And by the word of the testimony. Listen, if you're saved, you've got a testimony. Because you see, you were not always saved. None of us were born saved. None of us came out of the womb saved. And think about this. Being saved is not something that takes place at childbirth. Being saved is not something that automatically happens when a person turns 12 years old. We come to a place in life where we recognize right from wrong. Somebody tells us the gospel story. We hear how Jesus came and how he died on the cross for our sins, how he took our place, how he rescued us from hell. Without Christ, without the blood, without the cross, without the resurrection, we would die and go to hell. And at some point in place in our heart and our life, we accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. And listen, 
There's probably not a person in here today that would not like to go back to some place in their life and turn the clocks all around because of what you know now, because of what God's done for you, because how God has set you free. And you look back on some tear-stained years in your life or circumstances or situations, you say, God, I'm so embarrassed about that. I'm so sorry for that. I wish I'd have never done that. And the truth be known that if we could do that, we would all do that, but we cannot do it. But here's what we can do. When the devil comes your way and he begins to afflict you, you say, yes, you're right. I used to go there. I used to do that. I used to say that, but thank God because of the blood of Jesus and because of the cross and because of Calvary and because of the resurrection, you can't torment me with that anymore. He has set me free. Glory to God. By their testimony, every one of us have a testimony. How do you resist the devil? You plead the blood of the lamb. You put your testimony right back into the face of the tempter. And look at this, number three. And they love not their lives unto death. The apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians 1.21. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Make Jesus your everything. Make him the Lord of your life. Make him your, your, your very desire to get up in the morning, your very purpose for living. And then lastly, notice this, Ephesians 6, 13, stand your ground. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that she may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all stand. And I want to say in closing as our musicians come forward that as believers, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light with all rights and privileges of being a child of God. Here's what needs to happen. Every home listening today and every home listening here this morning, all of us need to get to the place or get back to the place where we're willing to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, We will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer.